This time on Finnegan's Garage, it's a brand new episode about the turbo boat. That's right. We're done working on blasphemy. It's time to go boating. Yeah, buddy. Ooh, new shirt alert. If you want one, click up here and smash that like button and hit the little bell up there that says subscribe and notifications. Do all those things so you know when I'm uploading brand new videos just for you guys. All right, we're backtracking in this episode. The rear of the boat, which is where the jet drive, the steering, a whole lot of things get mounted, this was already together. In fact, the boat went to SEMA show, you know. Everything runs at SEMA show. Yeah, right. So um, we're now redoing the things that we hurried up and did for the SEMA show that the boat, so that the boat looked cool. Now it needs to function, so come down here. This is called a transom adapter. This is a metal plate that bolts to the fiberglass boat hull, right? Well, our fiberglass boat hull, if you come over here and look this direction, is not exactly perfectly flat in the back. So when we made this plate and bolted it to it, if you push down on the bottom of it where those bolt holes go, if you look up here, it sticks out. And although we were able to tighten this down, what it was doing was bending the boat hull to the plate. This is quarter inch thick aluminum. And yeah, not a good idea. This was gonna stress crack the boat eventually. So we made a thinner plate, all right, out of 3000 series aluminum. Let me just switch these out real quick here. Try not to scratch the boat. Our new plate, because we made it out of thinner material, this is 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, now actually sits flush to the hull because we stuck it in our Mittler Brothers sheet metal break and actually managed to bend this. So now this conforms to the hull, but it's thinner than the other one. So when we go to thread things into it, like our steering adjusters, this boat has cable steering. This is an adjuster. It threads into it. It needs a three quarter inch thread. It's coarse thread. You can't get enough threads in this plate for this thing to actually work properly. So what we're going to do now is show you some TIG welding tips for aluminum, and we're gonna show you how we're gonna build up material on this so that we can drill and tap it and put our steering adjuster in there without using a quarter inch or thicker piece of aluminum. The most important thing this thing does is give the steering a place to go and a way to attach it to the boat. Well, when it's quarter inch thick, that's just enough to thread this in here. This is just under 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. We're only gonna get two threads in that, right? And two threads is not strong enough for this thing to be held in there. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get out my Miller TIG welder, and I'm gonna show you guys how to build up aluminum using the TIG welder right here so that when I go back and I drill and tap just this area, this will be plenty thick, we'll have plenty of thread in here. Let's talk about the equipment we need to TIG weld aluminum. This is a basic torch setup. In fact, this is the water-cooled torch that came with my Miller Welder Dynasty 280DX TIG welder. Now that's a machine that will TIG weld steel, stainless steel, aluminum. Um, it's a really flexible machine. It has an optional cooling system to keep the torch cold, which is what you want when you're TIG welding aluminum for long periods of time. Now this torch is nothing special. You find it on all different kinds of machines. What matters is how we outfit it when we go from welding carbon steel or stainless steel to aluminum, all right? Entirely different setup for that. So let's look down here. This right here is the back cap. This right here is where the gas comes out, all right? And on the back side of that, this is the collet that holds the tungsten and tightens it down in place. And this right here is your nozzle, okay? All of this stuff matters, especially the diameter of it, when you go to switch from welding steel or stainless to aluminum. So let's go over all the different options you have here. This is what you normally get with any welding machine you buy, okay? It's a long body setup, okay? And the gas comes out of these holes on the side. The tungsten comes out here. So the gas, exit the, the gas exits these holes, fills the body, and then comes out. I never use this. If you're on a budget, you don't care, whatever, you can use that. 
It just doesn't work as good as some of the other stuff out here. Now this is a short version of that, same deal. Tungsten goes down the middle, holes in the sides for the argon to come out, and then the shield and gas comes out of the cup right there, okay? This is a shorter version of that for getting in tight spaces. Again, I try not to use this. Here's why. When you move over here, okay, this is what's called a gas lens. Instead of the argon coming out of the holes in the side, filling up the cup and then coming out with a whole lot of turbulence, our argon comes out the front through this screen, and the screen kind of diffuses it, makes our argon puddle much smoother, and allows us to take advantage of a larger diameter cup like this one from, who's this from? Dogfab. A guy named Michael Furick makes these. This is called the FUPA 12. It's a big cup. When you compare diameters, you can see how this cup is going to allow a larger volume of argon to come out and cover the weld area than this one. That's cool, you know, larger volume. You need that. Works better when it's not turbulent, which is why there's another screen in here to slow the argon down, make it flow smoothly. You can either go here, even bigger, you know. If you've got to cover a large area you want to weld in, or your tungsten has to stick out really far. Like, let's say you're in a hard-to-reach area, and your tungsten needs to stick out that far. Believe it or not, that will actually work with this cup. You can stick it out inch and a half, almost two inches with this cup, and the shielding gas will still fill the area, flood it, and allow you to weld. These are great for everything but what we're gonna do today. We're working on aluminum. Okay. I go the opposite direction with aluminum. Really small nozzle exit on the cup. I stick with the gas lens. I want a large volume of argon. I want it to flow smoothly. I don't want it to be turbulent. So you find a cup like this where your gas lens will thread into it. And then this gives me, at least for my money, my best ability to weld aluminum. Again, I don't use that. I don't use that. And I don't use these. Will it work? Yes. Will it work as good as this with a gas lens? No. This is our tungsten. These come in several different diameters. Right here, you have 1 16th of an inch, 3 30 seconds in the middle, and 8th inch all the way over here. 1 16th I use for sheet metal. 3 30 seconds is a good all around size. And this is about the limit of those large diameter cups that you get from Dogfab. They actually recommend that you only use 3 30 seconds in those things. And then this big dog, 8th inch, this is what you want to use when you're going to run a lot of amperage, especially when you're welding aluminum. So that's what we're going to use here today. So I'll put these ones back. Let's talk about tungsten preparation. This is what your tungsten looks like when you get it brand new out of the package. Just cut off nice and clean. If I was welding thin aluminum or stainless or steel, I'd sharpen this almost to a point. Not quite, but almost. Because we're welding aluminum and it's thicker and we're going to have a pretty good amount of amps going, I'm only going to sharpen it a little bit, and then I'm going to ball the end of it. I'll show you how I do that right now. Okay, so what you want to do is come in at an angle here, run the drill as slow as you can. Oh, that's not good. It's not good. A fresh piece of tungsten chucked up in my power drill. We're going to run it slowly here. We're not running it fast, and we didn't sharpen it to a really fine point. Let's go over welder settings. We're going to turn the machine on. It's a little noisy because we have both the welder running and the coolant pump down here below. But the coolant pump is a nice feature because that is what's going to keep the welding torch from overheating. All right, so we'll start here on the left with polarity. Last thing I welded was stainless steel, which is why it's in DC mode. Now we're going to switch it to AC mode. We're going to come all the way over here, where it says AC wave shape. 
there's frequency and balance, all right? Right now, if I were to turn this knob, it's just gonna adjust the amperage, right? I don't wanna adjust that. Right now, what I wanna do is hit that button. It'll say balance. Right now, it's at 73%, which is a good, 73% is a good compromise between the penetrating power and the cleaning power of the machine. We're gonna turn this all the way down until it says ball. This is a setting you use on this Miller Dynasty 280DX to prep the tungsten for welding aluminum. Come back over to the welding table, I'll show you how it does that. I've got my work piece over here. We're not gonna to touch that just yet. I have a scrap piece of aluminum sitting here. It is grounded to my welding table. My machine also grounded to my welding table. This is the piece I'm going to use to turn that slightly beveled tungsten that doesn't have a point on it into a round ball shape at the end. Now this is going to happen no matter what I do. Um, if I was to just turn the machine on and start welding over here, this is going to change shape. It's going to become molten. It's going to become a ball anyway. So we do this ahead of time so that we can get a nice good ball on here, which will help us control the arc when we actually go to weld our workpiece. So all we do now is we set the tungsten on the workpiece, raise it back up, hold it steady, and just ease into the foot throttle until we get a puddle and until the end of the tungsten changes shape. Hopefully the camera can pick that up. We'll see. All right. If you look at the end of that, it just started to ball up. It's a little shiny at the end. That was at about 90 amps, okay? This is quarter inch thick plate. This is an eighth inch thick tungsten. I'm gonna give it more amps now and watch what happens to the end of this, okay? As it got hotter and as I gave it more amps, you saw the arc start to wander and then it stabilized. Once the end of that turned into a ball, the arc stopped wandering. Now we reset the machine and we're ready to weld. So we're still set into ball mode. We're gonna crank the balance up. 70% is a good minimum. The higher you get, you'll see there's a setting on this machine at 75%. I like it in between, 73%. It builds pretty good for me. Those are the basic settings of this machine you need, you need to actually weld aluminum. There's lots of tweaks you can do to this thing, but just for getting started, that'll do it. We have our tungsten balled up. We're going to clean our aluminum right now, and then we're going to weld. This is just acetone. I'm going to wipe up the area I need to weld. like that. All right, and if you look close, you'll see a scribe mark. This is the hole, the shape of it, that's in the boat hole. This is the fitting that's gotta come through it. The fitting is threaded. I need to build up weld inside of that scribe mark. So I'm gonna build up weld in here so that when I go back and drill and tap it, it'll be thick enough to have plenty of threads for this to thread into. I don't wanna go outside of this line because then this plate won't sit flat on the boat. All right. Now notice, I don't have the tungsten sticking very far out of the cup, okay? The closer this is to the cup, the better the coverage of the gas is gonna be. And the closer to the workpiece, the more stable the arc is gonna be. So you don't wanna run into it, obviously, because the moment you run that into the workpiece, you contaminate the tungsten. The moment you run the tungsten into the filler rod, you contaminate everything. So we wanna keep it close, but not on it. And then just work our way in a circle until we build up lots and lots of weld. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. And I did it. 
So that's what happens when you run the tungsten into the rod. You look down here, it's contaminated now. It's very dirty. And this is contaminated. Yeah, you could weld, you could keep going. But what happens once you do that is now the arc's gonna wander. It won't go down straight. It's not gonna be a very controlled puddle. So I'm gonna take the tungsten out, break the end of it off because with aluminum, when it gets contaminated, it contaminates it way back up in there. And uh, we'll clean this off real quick and then go again. See, nobody's perfect. Especially me. So how do we clean it? Well, obviously we can clean it with acetone. We can also use a stainless steel brush that as you can see, I only use on aluminum. That will help our cause. See, we were doing good. We were starting to run a bead there. Dab, 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 boo, run right into it. No bueno. So now all that's left to do is for me to break off the end of the tungsten, sharpen it, ball it again, and start over. Obviously that's time consuming, so try to not ever run the tungsten into the workpiece or the filler rod into the tungsten. It just slows you down. This is why a lot of people make weld, it's much faster. And now we'll ball the tungsten again and get it ready for welding. Now we let it cool off, find the center again, drill it, tap it, and this should fit in the boat and our adjuster should go in perfectly. That's how you take weld aluminum. Okay, check it out. I've already drilled and tapped these. I skipped those steps so you didn't get to see that, but you can see where I built the weld up around, adding valuable thread to the end of this. And then, this is our steering adjuster. This just threads in like that. There's a jam nut there to lock it in place. This transom adapter, after I put a couple more holes here and here and here, we'll go right on the boat and seal everything up. And then we can put our steering together. Here we go. Beautiful. Now that our transom adapter is threaded and back on the boat, let's connect our steering. Here's how this works, right? So this is looking at the rear of the boat from the inside. We have dual cable steering. It's a push-pull system called Calgo. And the way it works is we feed the cable through the inside of the boat, just like this. And that's that threaded adjuster we installed earlier in the part that we welded. This is the sheath. The sheath bottoms out against there. And then we tighten up the tension on the cable on the outside of the boat. And when you turn the wheel, it's a rotary style deal. One cable is pushed while the other one is pulled. So you can see, there's one side and here's the other, here's the jet drive. And on the outside of the boat, this is what you're looking at here. There's the cable for the left side. There's the cable for the right side. These get connected 
right here on this tiller arm. And so this is a crude demonstration of how it works, but if I pull on this cable, it steers the boat that way. If I pull on this cable, it steers the boat that way. So what I'm gonna do now is connect the cable clamps here, get this all tensioned, and when I turn the steering wheel, voila, our boat steers and is one step closer to being ready to hit the water. It's official. We have steering. Yes! Now we need wiring and plumbing, and you'll see that on an upcoming episode of Finnegan's Garage.